The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. When looking at this passage... Starting in verse 11, it says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. We know that the grace of God that he is talking about can be described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. The description here in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, goes like this. He says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The grace of God that has appeared to all men is that Christ, God sends his son, Jesus Christ, he knew no sin, and yet he pays for the sin of every human being that has ever lived. He makes a payment for sin that we deserve. We actually mounted up a debt, and Christ pays for that debt by becoming sin and incurring the wrath of God on our behalf. The grace of God is that God made a way so that we could be right with him without suffering the punishment for what we deserve. Now back to our text. He says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. That's only found in Jesus Christ. The grace of God that brings salvation is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Is that he died, that he was buried. He died for our sins and he was buried and then he rose from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. That is the grace of God that brings salvation. There is salvation in no other name but Christ. But see, in our text, it has appeared to all men, verse 12, teaching us, he's saying that the grace of God, he's saying that the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us something. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the gospel of Jesus Christ does not just teach us how to get to heaven. It teaches us what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Who we ought to look to and who we ought not to look to. We don't look for the look to the world to satisfy ourselves as Christians. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus, God has allowed you to be born again. He has regenerated your heart. He has given you a new spirit. The gospel of the Lord Jesus does not only teach you how to be saved, it teaches you how to live. Have we learned this? Have we come to this conclusion by looking at the gospel? At looking at the fact that God laid on him the sins of me. He laid on him my sin. I didn't have to pay for my sin. Jesus Christ pays for my sin. That should lead me to the conclusion that I should deny ungodliness. Worldly lusts. Do you deny ungodliness? Do you deny worldly lusts? Has the gospel of the Lord Jesus led you and taught you that denying ungodliness and denying worldly lusts is the way to live this life? If it has not, you need to learn. Look, he says worldly lust, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2, 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. What is sustaining you as a Christian? I get that Christ is keeping you as a Christian. But what sustains you on a daily basis has to do with what you're putting and placing as God. He said that the gospel of the Lord Jesus would teach you to run from worldly lust. It would teach you to deny ungodliness. That means whenever you're put in a place to either be godly or to be ungodly. You're, you're put in a place to do wrong or you're put in a place to do right. You desire to do right. And that's what God calls you to do. He calls you to righteousness, not to unholiness. He calls you to godliness, not to ungodliness. This is something that the Bible teaches should have taught you whenever you learned the gospel. Gospel is that Christ died for everything that you've done wrong. He paid your penalty and that should cause you to deny everything that put him on the cross. Your sin put him on the cross. Your ungodliness put him on the cross. Your disobedience put him on the cross. Your rebellion put him on the cross. Your undesire to do what God wants you to do put him on the cross. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He says, teaching us, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. Do you live soberly? Are there things in your life that cause you to not think clearly, to not think biblically? Are there more influences in your life that would have you to go the way of ungodliness than there are of godliness? It says it teaches us to live soberly, to live righteous. Righteous. The gospel, us not, God not giving us what we deserve for our sins, but laying on him the iniquity of us all, should teach us to live soberly, righteously and godly if the gospel of Jesus Christ has not turned you to godliness you've missed something in the gospel if the gospel of Jesus Christ is a get out of hell free card for you and has continued to be for years you've missed something Christ desires to teach you to live righteously to live godly and to live soberly In this present world. Do you ever realize that in John 17 he says, I would not that you take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. God's directive will in your life is for you to be kept from the evil and yet to be in the world. Something to think about. Verse 13 he says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We all as Christians should be looking and hastening to the day that Christ comes to take his bride, the church, away with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We need to be looking and desiring that day. I'll say one thing about this. We ought to desire that day, but every second of every day that God gives us breath, we ought to desire his spiritual presence now. Do you desire his spiritual presence over looking at Facebook? Do you desire his spiritual presence over checking Twitter? Do you desire his spiritual presence over making sure that you know what's going on at a, in a TV show. Do you desire his spiritual presence more than you desire to know what the score was for the game last night? Do you? Something to think about. We ought to look for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, he says, who gave himself for us. Christ gave himself for us. 
Bible says in Galatians 2, verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live for Christ because he died for us. Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us, that's Jesus Christ, gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. When is he going to redeem us from all iniquity? He wants to do it now. Are you just waiting to get to heaven in order to be purified? In a way, I am. But I'm not ignorant to think that my God's not big enough to redeem me from iniquity now. He says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. When's he going to purify himself to himself a peculiar people? Whenever they accept his son and he changes their life and he causes them to do what he desires them to do and love the things that he loves that they, ne they once hated. That's when God will pur purify himself a peculiar people. Your purity starts now. You're not only just going to be pure whenever Jesus shows up and makes you new like him. No, he desires to make you pure now. He calls you to godliness now. He calls you to sobriety now. He calls you to live righteously in this world now. He says, who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. When can you do work? Now, when do you do work? Whether it's for God or whether it's for somebody else or whether it's for something else, whether it's for something menial or something eternal. When do you do it? You do it now. We're not waiting to get to heaven to be zealous for good works. God has desired for us. God has set it up. God's gospel prods us, leads us, guides us to good works. Now. Verse 15, he says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You want to know why the reason why he has to say that no, let no man despise thee? You want to know why he has to say, Hey, somebody's not going to like this? Because nobody likes us. Everybody wants to look at Jesus as a flu shot. Everybody wants to look at Jesus as just, This is the way that you enter into the door, and that's it. The Bible says this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is knowing him. And in knowing him, you desire godliness. In knowing him, you desire righteousness. You desire sobriety. You desire to be purified from all iniquity. You desire to be a peculiar people, not caring what other people think, not caring what other people say, but knowing that your God paid a price for your sin on a cross. And in doing so, he didn't do that so that you could look just like the world, talk like the world, love like the world, love the things of the world, want the same things that the world wants, not be able to live with the things that the world can't live with. He says, denying ungodliness. Teaching us, the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live in sobriety, righteously, and godly in this present world. Is that our mentality? And if it's not, shame on us. Thinking about the gospel should not only make us thankful that God saved us, but it should teach us that denying ungodliness is the best way to live this life as a Christian. Denying unrighteousness and worldly lust is the best way to live as a Christian. That's what the gospel of the Lord Jesus should teach Christians. We have a tendency to live this life like the number one thing you need to do is get saved, which that's a great thing to do. But once you're saved, the gospel is supposed to teach you something other than I'm going to heaven. He says, teaching us, he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee.